To know me is to breathe with me. To breathe with me is to listen deeply. To listen deeply is to connect. It's a sound, the sound of deep calling to deep. Tadidi, the deep inner spring inside us. We call on it and it calls on us. We are river people. We cannot hurry the river. We need to move with the current and understand its ways. We wait for the rain to fill our rivers and water our thirsty earth. We watch our bush foods and wait for them to open before we gather them. We wait for our young people as they grow. The time for rebirth is now. If our culture is alive and strong and respected, it will grow. It will not die, and our spirit will not die. I believe that the spirit of Dadidi that we have to offer will blossom and grow. Not just within ourselves, but in our whole nation. Hi everyone, and thank you for coming to our last Yarning Strong of the year. Um, I'd firstly like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which I am on, the Wadawang people of the Kulin Nation, um, and acknowledge um, their elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge and pay my respects to everyone who is joining us today on Aboriginal land that you're on. Um, uh, uh, my name is Carissa. I'm a proud Darwin Gurungi and um, Wapri woman from Catherine Northern Territory. Um, and I am Support Act's First Nations Community Engagement and Social Worker. Deadly. Thanks for that, Carissa. Yami, yami, you mob. I'm Mitch Tambo. I'm a proud Gamilaray man, and I'll be your host for this session right here in this moment with you all. And thank you so much. I'm pumped at the caliber of panelists. There's some of you mob there sitting there that I've been longing to talk to since I was a young fella getting around. So, uh, yeah, as Carissa said before, this is our last um, yarn for the year. It's been incredible. We've had three. Um, you know, it's been very strong and uh, today we'll be talking about and touching on traditional healing and our mental health, which I think um, is so important and I look forward to all of your input. So um, with that said, 
I mean, for me personally, I know and feel in my heart that, you know, our traditional ways in terms of healing and the healing of country um, and the healing that comes with sitting and talking with family members and, you know, our, our law men and women in our communities um, has played such a pivotal role for me and my own identity, my belonging, my connectiveness, and certainly um, being off country and traveling and being on the road and all those kind, kinds of things, because it gives us something to be able to draw on and fill up our cup when we're feeling a bit diminished and feeling like that cup um, is la lacking that substance. You know, I know for me personally, I can go out, look up in the stars and immediately connect with certain stories and song lines and teachings that have been given to me that allow me to immediately just ground myself, feel connected um, and feel ready to go again. So, um, you know, and I'm also aware, not only for myself, but I'm sure a lot of you mob on the panel and listening can agree that for us as musicians, um, we play a massive role in terms of contributing to, you know, mental health, um, contributing to, you know, because when people connect to music and connect to song, um, they can often or not, I know for myself, can pinpoint certain situations, certain memories, certain, you know, things we're going through through life, whether it's celebrations or trials and tribulations, and some songs actually get us through some of our darkest times. So when we're on stage, there's actually a massive output and what i look forward to in talking in today's sessions is around how we as musicians can get back to our traditional practices and healings to also look after ourselves and nourish ourselves um, in this current climate and especially i think coming out of such a crazy nearly couple of years with covid um, here we go again about to get back on the road when we've also just come out of you know a lot of us living off country being so isolated and not having access so it's going to be interesting on this panel, you know, to get to it, um, to have this conversation and really open up how we can get back and tap in to our gi, do we, our heart and spirit through, you know, the beautiful sacred practices that we will call today as traditional healing practices. So with that said, Carissa, Let's you need to hand it on over. over. Yeah. Let's get it to the man himself, Mao Pao. Let's cross over to the panelists Ooh. and I'll just introduce all the panelists. Deadly. Um, so Mao Power is a proud TSI de, uh, de, de Bois, am I saying that right? <laughs> Man of um, Gado Mulinga Nation. <laughs> Tell me if I'm saying that. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, it, it's it's uh, pronounced Deibao from the Deibao clan of the Gudu Malu nation's top western region of the Torres Strait, but I, I appreciate you um, attempting to. Awesome. <laughs> to um, so uh, Mao Power is greatly respected as a voice of empowerment and inspiration among the people of the Torres Strait. He is one of the original rappers emerging from rich musical traditions of Torres Strait. Um, a local leader, a lyrical storyteller at a crossroads of indigenous and hip hop culture. Um, it is the art of storytelling that embodies and connect uh, that that embodies the connection of two cultures that makes Mao Power a truly unique Australian artist. Welcome, Mao. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Here. And um, I, I want to say thank you to um, you, Carissa, and Mitch. Uh, it's great to finally meet you and then have this discussion here, and also to the rest of the panelists, which um, I guess everybody well, everybody will have the privilege to be able to um, hear hear them speak. So excited yeah. to be here! Awesome, thanks, Mal. Um, Baden is our as a Torres Strait Islander, Islander and PNG descent from Madu Mada no, Mabudan. Mabudan, am I saying? And Hana Bada. Hanu Bada. Hanu Bada, <laughs> from, um, province from Papua New Guinea. He also has um, English and Irish and Chinese heritage. He joined Bangara in 2017 as part of um, the Russell Page graduate program. He has performed as an independent dancer um, and choreographer in the Melbourne Festival 2016. Um, and he also works as a singer and workshop teacher with Short Black Opera Company, performing with Deborah Cheatham's Pecan Summer. Um, with Bangara, he has had the opportunity to perform all over the world, including Denmark, Germany, India, Japan, Canada, 
and US as well as regional and national touring of Australia. That's amazing. Welcome, Baden. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, and last but not least, Jettison Wells, a proud Yolawari woman from Third World Land and working in Gadigal country as a narrated therapist. Her business, Habad Jing, I'm, 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 I've always, uh, I always get that mixed up every time I introduce you. Habajing, yep, um, narrative practice, focuses on people unpacking shame for what it really is, just another opinion. And in navigating the world of work, having known personally the demands of the con constructs, community service, redundancy, working overseas, returning to work after parenting, working as a single parent, poverty, homelessness, and stereotyping. She thinks she knows a little about how the economy contributes um, to community and country. As a grandmother, she is learning her Yuwalawe ancestral language to re reignite the use of language in Australian communities and stories told in our own world words. Welcome, Jettison. Yamagara Naya Dijida, Gulbe Yeye Naya Nila. No, which I hope was, hello, my name is Jettison and I welcome you. Thank you. How oh, beautiful. Um, all right. So before we go into this panel, I'm just going to let everyone know that um, if you do feel triggered with our conversation today, the helpline there is available for you. So it's um, 1 800 959 500, and that's option three. Um, there's also um, a lifeline and 24 hour, hour um, health services available if you, if you do feel triggered by these conversations and you do feel like you need to jump off. Um, firstly, I just wanted to also mention. Um, that uh, the factors of mental health in the music industry. So um, that affect our um, music industry people, but also performing arts um, people is low or irregular income. There's fewer safety nets. Um, the working environment, it's very transient. It's a competitive environment. Um, it's short term for some. And it's a lot of lot of physical strain. So those are the main factors that affect our music and arts community. But then we also have factors um, that affect our First Nations community. So that's intergenerational trauma, um, loss of land and culture, transgenerational trauma, um, grief and loss, racism, social exclusion, exclusion stolen gen, incarceration, poverty rates. Um, th living in third world conditions um, and lack of education and opportunity. Um, so in today's discussion, as Mitch um, amazingly put it, is we're just going to talk about um, traditional healing, um, traditional healing in, in, in the aspects of um, music and also bringing back traditional healing for our musicians and performers. So I'll cross back, I'll pass the reins to you again, Mitch, and um, we'll get into the conversation. Thanks, Krista. Um, first and foremost, I just want to acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation where I am today and, and acknowledge uh, their elders um, and descendants and, and people that have walked over this land since the beginning of creation and acknowledge that their law transcends into the Warrumbul, the Milky Way, uh, Yulagi's dances across this country and flows through the Bugai, the rivers and the waterways and just acknowledge them as the first mothers, fathers, doctors, uh, law keepers, agriculturalists and much more. And um, I just want to acknowledge each and every single one of you panellists as well and all your mob and ancestry. Um, and all that's gone before each and every one of you that's put you in this position today where we could be talking to, about such sacred practices. And, you know, these practices um, may have been lost for some of us, but they are embedded in our spirit. And I feel like in many ways, um, as throughout the arts, we get to express that, those powers and practices unconsciously sometimes when we go into that flow state and we let that out. And given the right moment in time, sometimes those, when it, we get to express that, we get to hit 
um, people that are in that room and in that moment in the spirit and they get a little piece of that healing that you know trans from, transcends from our ancestors so with that said Malpow I've got to say Bala it's been a long time coming this moment for me I have I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an avid listener I'm not gonna lie we're here we're in the moment first and foremost when we talk about healing and healing practice I just want to acknowledge that song you did with Uncle Archie um, freedom because I feel like that's a, a real moment there where you can feel um, you can feel the power, you know, you can feel the ancestors. Um, it's a song that really does hit you in the spirit. And for me personally, there's been many a times where I've just had it on repeat and just full ball in the car and just like, oh man, I just want some of that, you know, I just, just, where can I go and get more of that? So I just want to acknowledge that and just acknowledge what a beautiful song that is and, and the healing power in that. And, um, just let that lead into the question being, you know, when it comes to cultural and traditional healing and our mental health, what are some practices you you know in your tribes, and why is it important for artists and music workers to be to be reminded of it um, and bring it into their work? Thank you, brother. And I um, I want to say thank you very much for that introduction and uh, and acknowledge the country that I am on here. Like even though I'm from Zenat Kes, the Torres Straits, I am now based in Gimui country, in the tropical North Cairns. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge the ancestors from this place which I am speaking to everybody from. And I, I, I thank you very much for introducing that song Freedom as well because that was a moment in time where I was going through a very, um, uh, it was a searching, a searching point in my life. Being with everything, coming to one point for my whole um, experiences in life and then coming to be able to find my voice within that song uh, and having um, uh, someone as a beacon of light, someone like Archie, Uncle Archie Roach, you know, being there that guided me through and is one of the inspirations of why I got into music. Him as a storyteller, his album Charcoal Lane and Took the Children Away, those were moments and times that really inspired um, my journey. Um, if I go back to your question, the way I answer this question, um, excuse me, I go, I go back to my language a little bit. There. The way I will answer this question is simply this, that I have been fortunate to have uh, been an artist that traveled this world with my music, only to find over a 20 year period that all my answers were embedded in my culture. I returned back home to find that everything that I was searching for was taught to me at a very young age. When I explain this to people who ask me the question about, um, you know, why we do certain practices, uh, especially, and I can only speak from a male perspective growing up, from a young boy at five, I was taken and going through this process through initiation uh, by my uncles and the elders. And those were there to teach responsibility, but also open up the, the bonding, the bonding ship of what we have as male folks or men folks to be able to support each other, to be responsible men within our community and our society. I didn't realize until I got older and became an uncle and a father, how important these, this, this information and knowledge was and that everything that I searched for in answers were taught to me at a very young age. And it was there to be able to create a safe space within our culture, uh, to be able to communicate these things amongst the men folk uh, at that time, to be able to sort out disagreements and be able to share what we are going through emotionally. I compare that, and this is interesting because I spoke to this on radio yesterday, I have a podcast and I speak to it as well, and I had a couple of uh, men uh, young men on the show speaking to me about their experiences with men's group, how in some part of the construct, society has uh, molded into the, the westernized way, has conformed us to be able to, or conformed me to be able to not acknowledge my emotions. Whereas in my culture, we had outlets and means to express it through cultural dance, through storytelling, through our language and sharing, through community gathering. And this for a very long time, especially in my early years, was something that I um, didn't see value in until I got older and understood that this is the space, the environment. It's all about environment where we allow us to be able to express ourselves freely. And I carry that on within my, my music to be able to share those stories, coming out with songs like Freedom and all the others that followed. Um, Sing Strong was one of them as well. So. To answer the question here, yeah, the culture, if, if for me anyway, my, my experience is all the answers are there and the teachings that I've had growing up uh, were there to set to be able to uh, bring us to be strong warriors to walk through and be able to look after our community. Yeah, there's so much, so much in that. But 
Yeah, I love it. And it, it does resonate. And I think, um, yeah, the, uh, one thing that really resonates is what you said, like today almost for, for a lot of fellas and maybe um, Brother Baden will be able to elaborate later is that, you know, when we get to the idea of dance and, and fellas being able to express themselves through dance in these art forms, you know, sometimes you can get belittled and like, oh, you know, fellas don't dance, you know, they're a shame job. But the thing is, is there's so much in our dance and it grows us in so many different ways. And, and as we get older and those stories that we're dancing manifest, it, it all plays a role in how we develop and how we heal and stay strong. So it, I really resonate with what you say there because it is, it comes back to navigating those two worlds. And there's really a lot, there's a lot in that. You could really explore that further. So thanks very much for those words, Bella. No, but it's tough. Yeah. But Baden, Baden Hitchcock. I don't know you too much, my brother, but I have to say, I feel like we've already connected because I had no idea that you're connected to PNG. My wife's from West Papua. So uh, definitely a fan of the islands just above us, no doubt about that. And uh, if I'm going to be honest, you know, when I was a young fellow, all I really, when people said, what are you going to do after school? I'd be like, you know what, I'm going straight to Nasr and Bangara. But little did I know I'm stiff as an ironing board and that was never going to happen and, and I'd have to sing. But anyway, I'm sort of envious, but maybe we can work around it, come together, do a gig, I don't know. But it's not about me. This is about you and healing. So let's get straight to it. As um, So I've got a similar question for you, but I mean, maybe you can elaborate more down the path of dance um, and the healing, healing within that. That'd be awesome. But what are some of the cultural healing practices you know, and why is it important for people working in the performing arts industry to recognize this as a practice and implement it in their lives? Thanks, Mitch. Um, so happy to be here today. And I'd also like to acknowledge among Gadigal country. I think it's so amazing that we're all across the nation and all different countries from different walks of life when we're coming together for a talk like this, which is so important. Um, I guess my approach to Cultural traditional healing has been quite different, say, to my mum or my bubu, which is my grandmother. My bubu was born in Mabuduan, which is just across from Saibai. So Saibai being the most north part of Australia, you can see Papua New Guinea across the water. Like, it's a, just a short dinghy right away. Um, and those ancient trading routes between Saibai into Mabuduan across the Gulf over to Port Moresby area, have been going on for thousands of years and I guess that's my cultural heritage and that's how the the way the way it lies and that my mum was born in uh, Ihu which is a small village in the Gulf province so they had a very different upbringing to me who I was born in Sydney and grew up on Darawal country so I guess my relationship to this topic has been one of reconnecting and understanding how big a deal it was to go back home. So like the first time I went back to Saibai or the first time I went and met the family in Tunnel Bada over in Port Moresby, I didn't think it, I realized how big a deal it was for my family there. They're like, when I went to Tunnel Bada, they're like, oh, bubu ganiga natugu. Like, oh, this is this person's grandson. And then, you know, I obviously don't look, uh, I'm a lot, fairer than a lot of my family back home. And I'd go, oh, what? They, they couldn't believe it. But then I would slot in into this whole community and this whole family that I would, I'm starting to learn so much more about. And learning about this process, you realize you come from such a long line of storytellers mm -hmm. and there's such power in that and such healing in that. Um, and I feel like the arts industry, while it's paying respect to a lot of these First Nations stories now, I don't think they understand the strength that has in terms of the way, a way forward as a community, not just for black fellas, but as the building blocks of what the, how society needs to go. Um, yeah, so I think this idea of storytelling and storytelling becoming ritual, uh, being a dancer with Bangara, we're really blessed that we're gifted stories from all around the country. And we perform these stories nation globally. And whenever we go anywhere, uh, especially overseas, we'll connect with other First Nations communities there and do exchanges. And you just understand that there's all these like grounded similarities between 
you know, First Nations mob. Yep, yep, love it. Can I ask you, I just want to ask you a question and that is, you know, as a dancer and, you know, being able to be in a situation where you get to learn and, and share so many different styles of dance and song lines and all this, really, it's really sacred business. Can you tell us a, a moment um, where you've been so in the moment and you've come out of it dancing and you've gone, wow, like I think that was just, that something happened there. Like I feel different. Like there was something healing in that. I don't know what that was, but yeah. I, that wasn't just physical. Um, I can think of two moments for that. Um, one was when uh, I went to the Torres Straits for the first time, which was with the company. We went up to TI and performed there on the stage in the park. And my aunties came down and watched and uh, we performed a work called Ibis, which is named after the Ibis stores on the islands, which is, I guess you could say like an IGA. Okay. And yeah, performing for community is always really different to performing, you know, in a proscenium stage in a constant, that sort of building. Um, the energy they give, um, the kids running around on the stage. Um, and I feel like that's also a really important aspect of it that when that, wherever we go, we teach workshops. And I, I loved teaching those workshops to the kids on TI was a really grounding moment for me of uh, passing on passing on and sharing what you know is a, a big healing practice also. Yeah, yeah. And another moment that was really special to me is when we toured to India and we connected with some of the First Nations community in central India called the Beganese people. And it was really special because a lot of the women there um, had full markings across their bodies, which my wow. Google also had. So like in PNG, a lot of the women always had their body tattooed as the men went on their voyage across to the Western Gulf province area. And we learned some of their dances and that exchange was really special. Uh, and it played with time in a really uh, unique way. Like, I feel like a lot of cultural dancing when you, when you are in this dance, it, the, the idea of linear time um, changes it becomes circular and it can go on for, uh, yeah, it goes on for not sure how long, because, you know, it could go on for three hours, but you're not sure how long you've been dancing sort of thing. Yep, yep. <laughs> I love that. And I, I love what you just said. It's circular and we're circular people, you know, and, and we are connected to everything and everything has its place. So I think, you know, and you do, there, there, there's time, but there's not really time, you know, and th things will be how they're meant to be. Um, and it's interesting because when we're talking about healing practices, you know, again, like what um, Bala Malpau said before, you know, it's that it's that push and pull, that tug of war with the Western and the traditional ways, because, you know, we, we have time, but we don't. But then when we talk about healing and we talk about grief and loss and all these things in the Western world, we're so pushed to move on quick and get mm. back to our jobs and do all this stuff that we don't get a shot at grieving, you know, and we start to clog up the rivers of our spirit. But in our way, you know, look at sorry, but it can go on and on and on. There's no sense of time. And it allows your spirit, it allows your everything to just heal and go through what it needs to go through. So I think within your, your sharing of stories there, you've opened up a massive passage of conversation, you know, just around that. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. But uh, Jettison, Yama Yama, can yeah. I just can I just say, we could just talk about language and the healing in that. I mean, uh, I just love that the journey you're on, the revival of language. And, you know, when we talk about healing practices, you know, speaking your language and, and re being a part of that revival and that practice is so healing for, for yourself, isn't it? I know for me, it's, um, it's just incredible. So to hear you just rock it today, that just open up, bang, powerful. Language is a huge thing. I'm, um, I'm 53 years old and, mm. um, you know, because I'm 53 years old, there's, uh, there's different parts of history that I've had to experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of my favorite uncles tells me this story of uh, my father is 20 years older than me. And uh, my uncle tells me this story about how he and my father, when they were in their 20s, um, they went to a pub, uh, the Hemet pub. And my grandfather was there, my grandfather, who's very, very dark. And my father never went anywhere near him like stayed away from him 
because at that particular time, um, it it wasn't seen, you know, as something that you should do to go near, um, you know, near someone who was, um, you know, like dark skinned. Mm. And this is the thing, like when we heal, this is all part of it. This, you know, this happened way before I was born, but this is part of my history. I And when I learn my history, I have to learn the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm. That's the thing. It's um, we're a complicated bunch. Let me tell you, um, it's it's not as you know as simple as that. There's this westernized idea that you know I have a broken finger, okay, mm. fix the finger. Um, I have diabetes, you know, fix the diabetes. Yeah, it's not like that, you know, mm. from where we come from. We've got this this holistic idea where it's it's all connected. Yeah. So things that have happened fifty years ago affect the way that I think about myself now. Mm. Um, the way that I want my grandchildren um, to be in fifty years from now that affects, you know, the way that I am now. So um, it's not it's not a simple case. I mean, although I shouldn't say simple case, but it's. It's not a case of sitting down with someone and saying, hey, I don't feel too good about myself. Um, can we have a chat? Mm. It's much, much more than that. Mm. It's about getting our history, you know, getting our future and trying to find a link between that so we can jump from mm. one to the other. That's how I look at it. Yeah, I love that. I love what you've said there because, uh, yeah, our way it's not just about getting a Band-Aid and going whack, that's the end of it. It's about what's under there. Okay, you broke your finger, but did that happen because there's something going on with your ankle? That's right. Exactly. We got to get exactly. we got to get to the root and pull it out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it, it's true though. It really is, and and that's the beautiful thing about you know our culture and the way we do things. But I think even now though, it's interesting and and it's real and it's raw. And thank you for sharing that um, that little bit there because here you are in your fifties, um, getting back to language. But in doing that, it also opens up a lot. Like you said, you know, it, it take it could take you back to being 12 or to these things where you're saying, you know, couldn't even speak to grandfather because he was so dark. You know, you have to go through all these passages. And I think often people don't realize that, that it's not just, yeah, I'm accessing these words and yay, there's so much to it. Um, it's not even, oh, it's not just even can reconnecting to culture and ancestry. It's also connecting to the recent pain of history you know, stolen gen, all these other things. So it really, yeah, it's layered and it's complex. And I think that's why these convos are so important. So with that said, I do have a question, if you don't mind, Jettison. That's all right. Are you sure? <laughs> all right, here we go. How, <laughs> how important is cultural healing for our mob? And why should our arts and music industry be setting time aside each day to incorporate this into our everyday lives? You know what, when um, I'm an Aboriginal counsellor, mm. so people call on me uh, because I say that I'm an Aboriginal counsellor because they think they're going to get something different, you know, out of me than they would get from um, from someone, someone other, you know, than an mm. Aboriginal counsellor. Mm -hmm. What I remind people is that we are the answers to someone's prayers. Mm. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, people that are connected to me blood-wise, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, those people went through some terrible, terrible times, terrible times. Mm. My family was thrown, you know, in Gaduga, they're thrown on the back of a truck and mm. taken to, you know, taken to Charleville and, and kind of Mulla and said, you know what, you look like everyone else. There you go. You're going to fit quite comfortably in there. Mm -hmm. And it's just not the same. I don't come from Darwin. I don't come from Tasmania. I'm not a Anungu person. I'm not a Gadigal person. I'm a Yawalari woman. Mm -hmm. And that is an incredible strength for me. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible strength for my daughters and my granddaughters and my sons as well. So when it comes to healing, for me to, to 
commit to the responsibility of my ancestors and commit to the responsibility of the future generation, I have to grasp, you know, that culture. And I have to try in some way to have it keep going, you know, on, um, on a daily basis. They fought for us. And I mean, you know, some people might think that I'm getting a bit on the soapbox, but they did. You know, like the reason that they fought back and that they didn't agree with the laws and that they lost their lives is so we could be here mm. and speak you all or I, and mm. that I could say to, to Mitch, you know, yeah, <laughs> mama, you know, those sorts of things. Like it's, um, mm. it's incredibly important. Like I often say to people, um, you know, before I start counseling or before I start mental health, you know, training, I say to them, you know what, think of yourself as a flow in the river and as you're going along you're collecting stuff from the bottom you're collecting stuff from the you know from the river bank you're getting things that are falling from the sky you know and things that are falling from the trees things that are um, that relate to you you know that make you a better person but it's okay to leave the other things you know for everyone else like it's it's okay to find your unique way of healing your mental health. Mm. Um, got to get a tear in my eye now, Mitch. God, what Sorry. are you doing? I Mate? prepared you. I said, is it all right if I ask this question? <laughs> I prepared you. But I know your answer is so real, so honest. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I can't thank you enough for uh, being so open in answering because um, – there's so much in it and I'll, I'll choose not to go too far in and I'll just go back into your answer and just yes. resonate for a second. That is, you know, what you said, and that is, you know, you're a proud Uralari, Uralari woman. Yeah. You know, when we talk about stripping this bandaid off, it we're stripping like it back and back and back to the point of, it's not just we're Aboriginal. There was hundreds and thousands of different dialects spoken. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of that bandaid just chucked across the nation to go, well, you're all the same. It's invalid because we're not, you know, we share, we share similar things, but we have so many differences too. That's you know, right. we have similar practice, but different practice. And it, it, it's also very much important because it all comes back to our identity and connectiveness and beyond, you know, who we are. So, um, yeah, when we talk about stripping band-aids off, I mean, there's, there's not really any small ones at this point. They're all quite large, aren't they? And they're all so, so very deep and meaningful. So yeah, thanks very much for being so, so open with the question. Um, Mal Pau Bala, I'm back. This ain't over. You're sitting there very respectful, but I'm, I see you. I see you. We ain't done yet. <laughs> all right, here we go. So here's, here's a question. I've got, I've got two questions here. Yep. Um, the first one is, is, you know, you've traveled extensively, you've done so much, um, you know, you've paved, you've paved the way big time for a lot of up and coming rappers and just, you know, our mob in general, just to see you on stage as such a big, bold presence, getting it done, you know, you've done so much. So with that said, and coming back to healing practices, is there anything that you've ever incorporated or put in place to protect your own self and spirit um, whilst traveling that, you know, would occur from healing practices and things like that? Uh, yes, yes, I have. And thank you very much for the question. First, I'd like to acknowledge, um, you know, Baden and Jeddah. Thank you very much for the inspiring answers, and you know, great. Thank you for sharing. I'm just sitting here, just mesmerized by it, and you're just like absorbing everything that you guys are saying. Um, you know, traveling. I, I understood at a young age that um, as a performer, uh, I, I was told by an elder that we are conduits of energy. We bring on energy, we take energy from people, and that's the environment. Even when I do performances now, we go through a whole, like, a ceremony or like a ritual at the beginning to invite the ancestors to work with us. Mm. Being that we opened up to another realm means that we take on everybody else's energy as well, things that are around us. And at first, when I started out in, this, in, in the industry, I... I I didn't understand what was happening with my reactions to a lot of environments that I was performing in. And um, then my elder, who's a mentor, came and he told me, this is what's happening. Uh, so I got very conscious about that and started to set up the parameters and understand that, okay, I'm a vessel for the energy at this point, so I need to be able to release that. After I do shows and tours extensively, my, my go-to is I always go back home. 
I have to be in my natural environment to release everything that's in me. Uh, the, the salt water heals me. I go out, I sit, just me in the beach and the ocean. It allows me to meditate and go to deep thought and center myself again. Uh, being around family and culture has always been that for me uh, and allowed me to be able to be centered again and come back. And I love going back home. And uh, Ben, you, you know this, I, I go back home and I'm not Maupa when I'm home, I'm just Patrick boy, you know, and I go there and my grandmothers and grandfathers, they discipline me, they speak, and I just go back into the, na the, the normal environment that, that I am, like, you know, they get me running, making tea, and go and do this, <laughs> go and do that. <laughs> so it's and that, that's, um, and my little brother, Chris, Chris um, um, Tamway, he says this, uh, he has a perfect saying that that is there to make sure that the elevator doesn't get stuck up in the top level. Okay, yeah. uh, it, it's just like, okay, <laughs> you get back down to earth now and reconnect to who you are and you can never lose yourself once I'm in, the, once I'm in that environment. So that's, that's what I've done and my experience over time has always um, uh, made that um, a priority. I run multiple businesses now, so I incorporate my culture into the business to be able to know that we have cultural principles over our business values and principles and that's there to guide us to be able to make sure that we stay connected and stay grounded in everything we do. And I do that uh, uh, as a, a key philosophy in everything that I do right now. Beautifully said. Love it. So with that said, um, I mean, I, I could jump on this and go for it, but I'm choosing not to. I'm like, I'm like, just stop, man, stop, stop. <laughs> so I'm just going to move on because there's so much I want to say. So what are some tips you can give people in terms of cultural healing and how can music workers in general take these practices on tour with them? Wow, that's that. How long do you want to go with this one? <laughs> that's why I stopped, so, brother. <laughs> the, the cultural practices is really, for me, first reconnecting and owning the identity. Like reconnection is always, or connecting. Not, no, I won't say reconnection, connecting. Uh, my, my siblings, they lived and grew up down in Cairns. And I always tell them, your culture is dormant within you. When you're ready to receive it, it will activate and it will be revitalizing you. And you will mm -hmm. see the world differently. Um, and that's just from my experiences. Uh, so being proud of who I am, and when we're at the beginning of like this conversation, we say, I say I am Deibao, Gurumaluilga, I am from Zenat Kes. I have centered myself and understood that this is the perspective that I'm willing to share with you. Uh, and we've all connected on that level. Through music, I've also carried that on as well. I'm a storyteller, not a hip-hop artist. Mm. I just found the medium of hip hop to be able to translate what I am trying to bring, the value and the messages. You know, even if you look at the culture of hip hop, it was all based and built off um, First Nations culture. Like the elements within it is dance and movement, uh, storytelling, which is rapping, uh, graffiti artists, which is the art, the visual arts that we have, and the, the music comp composition, which are DJs. And they're there ultimately to capture the ultimate element from the five elements of hip hop, which is knowledge, the knowledge that we've gained and the knowledge that we pass. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it all revolves and has been stemmed from my cultural values. And that's that's the world that I, I like to keep my environment. And that has been my guiding North Star. Beautiful. Thanks, Bala. Thank you. Baden. Get ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nah. What are some uh, cultural healing practices um, that the performing arts industry use and how will this help when touring? Um, so I guess for me, uh, with Bangara, when we're touring, we have to play a lot of different roles and some of these stories or roles we play can be quite traumatic. So we're, mm -hmm. whether we're reliving a massacre scene, whether we're reliving a rape scene, whether we're reliving a um, a hunting scene, or you know, it 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 segues through these different parts of colonial history and ancient history and living history. And for me, I find that the breath and like like Pat was saying, uh, like my mum would always say but also what Pat was mentioning before about going down to the ocean, grounding yourself, going out bush, going back home. Uh, but I would use breath to get into a character. Say, for example, the last work we did um, was Sansong, which was a Kimberly story about 
uh, the Great Sandy Desert, and it was about their sacred water holes and just the colonization colonization story of the Great Sandy Desert. And I was playing a guy in the pit of despair, I guess, like, you know, when you're down that hole and you can't really see the light. Mm. And to get into this character, I would have to shorten my breath. Like you would, you would almost like while on stage, you would, you'd create this hypervent, hyperventilation or like quick inhale, exhale to get you into this heightened state so that you could then be this character. And mm. then you are that, you are that person and you, you relive that every night. Cause we do, you know, 80 plus shows, like we'll do 60 shows in Sydney, then we go to Brisbane, then we go to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, we tour it around. So you have to really develop coping mechanisms for yourself to deal with playing these heavier roles. And mm -hmm. coming down from that after a show, you would you you'd always need to take it back to the breath, I find. You would use breath to go into that, and then you'd use breath to come out, out of that and these slow, deep breaths um, and sitting and meditating and connecting with the ground, like taking your actual shoes off. Um, yeah, to release, to release that energy. Like, mm -hmm. like Pat was saying, performance is all about this transfer of energy between the audience and you, and then your ancestors and your mm -hmm. spirit. And it's just like, it's this ebb and flow. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I, you, yeah. You, you brought me back to a time actually, um, at university, I was, I was young. We'll, we were like in high school or whatever. And you went to this thing to see if you're going to go to uni or not, you know, one of those things. Anyway, this lecturer, he got all of us mob into a room and he did this exercise. He, he normally done with, you know, not fellows and what he got us to do. We didn't know anything about it. It was write everything down about us that, that mattered, that we cared about, that was close to our heart. And then we wrote it down and he come up and got them all and ripped them up into pieces and just chucked them in the ground. And it was his way of saying um, as an exercise to teach people how to empathize with the stolen gen, but with doing it with our mob, like it brought so much to the surface, like the whole room was done because of the transgenerational stuff that's already within us. You know what I mean? So in bringing it back to you, I was just hearing you speak and it brought me back to that. But what you do is, in, is a, such a deep level, it's so much deeper than that. You go and embody some of these most horrific acts and stories that's ever happened to us and transform into that and embody that pain and that emotion whilst carrying your own transgenerational stuff. You know, how, how do you come out of it? You know, what it, it's that. breath, you know, like it's so deep. Is there, is there any traditional practice that has been given to you to sort of protect yourself in doing that? Or it, yeah. it's just really getting into the breath and just really allowing you to, to come back, I suppose, like lose yourself and come back. How does it work? Cause when you, when you just depicted it, um, it really dawned on me, like what a serious job that is that you have and sacred and conveying those messages, you know? Um, I guess there's two important things that I would respond to this from is what I was mentioning before about, I feel like a lot more art companies need to do this, but mm. one of Bengara's missions is when you tour, you're always trying to connect with, you know, who's mob, where are you? Mm. Whose country are you on? And you need to relate to that and connect with them. And usually we'll be able to have a welcome to country and do a smoking ceremony. And like that ritual and ceremony helps ground, of course, of, like you would all understand it, it welcomes you onto country so that then when you're telling these traumatic stories, it can, your spirit and self feels comfortable to then release, release energy and release whatever you had to build up for a specific performance. Yeah. And I think uh, another really important aspect of mental health that I feel like even a lot of black fellas sometimes forget about is diet and like, how did our mob used to eat and what do we eat now and how does that affect us? And mm -hmm. Um, looking at some of the, like going back to what my mum cooked me as a child, uh, I think that's been a big 
thing for me. And, you know, your body is sacred. Mm -hmm. it, it's the only one you have. And if you don't treat it right with what you're putting in there, mm -hmm. then how do you think your spirit or your mind will be thriving or, you know, the, the, the well-being of what that is. So I, I know I'm not just speaking as a dancer, like, oh, you need to eat healthy, be fit. But it's like, man, everyone needs to do this for their health. You mm. know? We're getting deep right now. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying, brother. I, I can't even talk. I'm doing a malpower on you right now. I've got to move on because I'm on, <laughs> I'm on the diet buzz right now. So we can't go there because it's so important. You know, it is, it's healing. And anyway, I've got to move on because... Baden, you shouldn't have, shouldn't have went there man but i know what you're saying it's it's not just about being a dancer it, it's your mental health it's it's your spiritual it's it's everything what you put in your body so Baden, touched on it and i just advise anyone out there just start googling that's all you gotta do all right jetta i'm back <laughs> look after me on this one please all right yeah. these fellas they're they're just getting to me it's going deep all right i'm loving i'm loving this session by the way and i hope everyone out there tuned in i hope you're loving it too because there's some real yeah. real keys in this one it's beautiful yeah. um as a narrative therapist mm -hmm. what are your views on getting back to our traditional ways of healing and mental health for the mob and what aspect in counseling do you see when it comes to cultural healing you know what um i made a joke before and i said you know we're bloody complicated <laughs> and, and we are we are bloody complicated we're we're holistic people. Mm. What happens to our neighbor happens to us. What happens in our community happens to us because our, our neighbor and our community, you know, is our family. Mm. And the thing is, is that that goes one step inside of us as well. Like, because we're holistic people, what happens in our head happens in our heart. Mm. It happens in our history. And it happens in our future. And because it does that, it comes right back to happening in our community. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to healing, we've got to consider, you know, like the whole picture. You know, it's mm -hmm. we, we can't just say, hey, we've got a sore finger or hey, we've got a sore toe, you know, and fix that sort of stuff because there's mm -hmm. there's so much in there that affects, you know, like how we feel. So practices go like beyond the focus of the individual mm. or the symptom you know they they come back to us as um connecting to community or connecting to country mm. or for some people um it's either you know connecting to ancestry so if i'm talking about practical things that can help you you know help you through mental health simple things like starting to become you know, like a part of the environment. Mm. And people might say, oh, what shit are you speaking? What the crap <laughs> is that? <laughs> but really, like, this is what we would have done 200 years ago, 500 years ago, just, you know, simply moving to the rhythm, you know, of the wind of the trees. Mm. You know? That isn't just something that's helping us out with our individual symptom. It's mm. taking us back to the way their ancestors, you know, would have done it. Um, you know, relating, you know, one of my favourite ones is relating relaxation to, to the crispness of breaking eucalyptus leaves, you know, like in your hands. And, you know, taking that in and smelling it and, and knowing that whenever you smell eucalyptus, if that happens to be, you know, the land that you come from, mm. um, it can make you relax. You know what I mean? So, yeah. It's not just talking about what's happening to us, you know, like individually. And one of the very, very important ones that I think people forget is talking with the elders because they remind us, and like I said before, they remind us that we are the answers to their prayers. We're incredibly important, you know, like to the future of our race. Mm. And we can forget that, you know, we can... Um, be so focused on what's happening to us individually which is important don't get me wrong it's very very important but we can get so focused on what's happening to us individually we don't realize the responsibility that we have as part of our community yeah so you know a lot of it is about um getting back to the environment stuff i can't agree anymore i mean it's it's another deep one because um 
it's all connection. It is. And we are circle people and we're connected to everything. And everyone is connected to everything mm. in a way. And I guess the only way for um, viewers, anyone tuned in um, that don't understand this concept, think about, I guess, for an example's sake, it's holidays. You decide to go camping with the family. And I don't mean glamping. I mean, it's a tent. <laughs> think about what happens. You tend to walk yeah. barefoot. Yeah. You tend to go to bed earlier. You tend to get up with the sun and yeah. you always come back feeling refreshed. And you think yeah. it's because you've had yeah. time off work, but you've actually just stripped it back and connected. That's it. That's you've gone to bed on sundown. You've come up with the sun. You're out getting the sun. You're barefoot. You're connected. Everything you said is so on the point. And yeah. when it comes back to our mob, it's so true what you said. You know, you go home, you get that leaf, you break it, you rub it in your hands, you have a big smell of it. And you're just like, ah. Oh. I'm home. And one of the one of the things I always reflect on is sunset out at Booba Lagoon, um, picking uh, guttawee, sandalwood. Yeah. And I always get taken back to that moment. Yeah. Um, the barefoot, the birds singing, all of it. And it and it's just like a big exhale in the spirit, you know. It's it's a beautiful thing. And it's it's like what Baden said before with food, it's connection. It's yeah. being connected to what you're putting in your body and understanding what that is gonna do for you in turn. You know, it's these it's just golden nuggets all around tonight. Let's just be honest. I love it. Thanks so much, Jenna, for your input. Really appreciate it. Awesome. All right, Mitch, I'm going to cross over to you. I've got a really important question for you. And I think this one is, you know, um, a big one for the night in terms of healing. Um, and I also just want to touch on what all of you um, guys said. It's you're hundred percent correct. It's a holistic thing. We not only look at our physical, we look at our physical, mental and emotional, um, that connection to land. It's, it's everything put into, into one. Um, and so in saying that, I just, I, I want to touch on the fact that now that we're, we're in this Western world and we're in this Western, Western culture, a lot of um, their healing practices or a lot of healing practices are, are mentioned as, you know, the main ones that we need to be accessing in terms of um, our mental health, in terms of, um, you know, our medical journal our journey. Mm. Um, it's always recommended that we go to the westernized way mm. and, a lot of our practices and a lot of our traditional ways aren't recognized within the Western society. So um, my question for you, Mitch, mm -hmm. is how, how, do we, how do we put our traditional healing and our cultural healing back at the forefront and um, get, get the Western society to recognize that um, when it comes to our mental health, we need to be healing traditionally and culturally and um, not um, westernize um, the way that we heal. Um, and if any of you guys want to jump in, um, jump in. But yeah, Mitch, over to you. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think for us, first and foremost, um, if, if you haven't already, this isn't a generalization. So I'm just pretending like I know nothing. I would say that it, you have to get back to the reality of our culture um, and the reality of our practices. Um, and they have been here, you know, documented 60,000 plus years since the time of creation. Um, it's not our practices that are holistic. It's our practices that are medicine. Mm. Um, ours isn't the alternate route. Ours is the one that's been here the longest. Um, Western medicine has got a lot of keys and it's great and I'm not devaluing it, but what I am doing is putting a lot of value on our culture and our practices because there's so much there first and foremost. So I think it's like changing the script in your head because all of us have been constantly conditioned throughout our childhood and everything to not even take control of our health, but just to do what we're told. Just rock up. It's the person in a white coat. Tell me what I need. We do it and we walk out and we don't even question it. So it's time to start questioning. And I just mean questioning a way of like, okay, cool. So you're going to give me these. Okay, great. Um, so what do they do? Is there any side effects? You know, X, Y, and Z. Like just get get um, embedded in your own health journey. 
you know, um, and start finding out <clears throat> what it is you're putting in your body. And it's like food too, you know, we get told all the time to take all these things where sometimes in a situation, not all situations, but there's a, an, a, there's a beautiful route that could be changing the diet, you know, especially when we look at type two diabetes, I'm not saying get off the meds or anything like that, but I'm saying there is options to explore in your diet that could help big time. So it's about getting back to it. And there's this amazing doco that I watched once and, um, they explored all these different healing methods over the around the world. And what the one they come back to at the end was ours. You should, the best thing you can do is eat like Aboriginal people of Australia did before colonization. It's the best diet you're going to get on. You know, it's incredible. So it's getting back and changing the dialogue in our head and going, wow, there's, there's actually so much value in ours. I think I'm going to explore this first. I'm not discounting Western medicine. Maybe I'll do them equally together because that might end up in the best result. And I mean, in terms of mental health, um, you know, I got asked this the other day in a podcast and the question was, what does Aboriginal culture have to offer mental health, people dealing with mental health issues? What, what does it have to offer? And my response was, to try and put it like in a short format, I said, well, what our culture has to offer is peace in a time where there really isn't peace. Um, we're in this forever changing pressured situation that we can never seem to get out of. Um, sometimes it feels like an entrapment, like you're, you're mentally enslaved to something you can't get out of. And what our culture has to offer is peace. And when you, when you go and find that peace and you, and you dig further within that, what you find is what's sitting there is unconditional love from country. And I feel like for a lot of us out there that, you know, come from displaced ancestors, um, stolen gen, fragmented family trees, fragmented cultural practices. It doesn't mean that it's over for you by any means because all you have to do is start accessing what's already inside of you, what's in your spirit, because it's already there. And we just have to access it. You know, we don't even have to get to country at this point, but we just have to acknowledge and, and, and like turn on the ignition of what's inside our spirit. And that's the oldest living continual culture in the planet that comes from the most spiritual connected people to have ever walked this land that ha that had all the answers, you know, and all you have to do is start to acknowledge that and feel that and then start to walk in what comes next. And I mean, when you get to, when you get to country and you sit on country and you just get the shot at being still, it's the, it's the, the best counseling session ever in a lot of ways. And I'm not saying don't go to a counselor because they're great, but I'm saying, you know, for me, I've written songs about being on country. You know, my song Love was about that healing experience. And I, and I wrote another, released another song lately called Heal, which is about country too. But in that song Love, it says the first verse, as the cockatoos sing on sunset, stars like the sky of ancient stories, lost in the dance of the fire, I'm at peace. But the whispers of the wind, they keep calling me home as I recount being off country. And it says, the chorus is break my heart open set my spirit free with love. And that's what I believe country does when we go and access country and we sit and we be still. And I don't mean like I go back to Tamworth and kick it in, in the house, watching movies with the mob and on my phone. I mean, like you go back, sit on country out in the bush and you just be still. And I mean, it's a layered question, but I just feel like, I guess, you know, we've just got to get back um, to doing what we do. And that's just connecting with, with country. You know, it's not connecting with TikTok. I mean, we've got amazing communities on social media, incredible communities, you know, we're on there getting it done, but we've got to get back and connect to country. And if you don't know where your country is, that's okay, because wherever you are, you know, there will be mob, there will be a community that will embrace you and allow you to connect. You don't have to feel disconnected because we're not a, we're not a group of people that exclude, we include. You come into our mob, and you walk away with extended family. That's how it works, you know. Um, and we've been like this for thousands of years, hence our song lines, our kinship, all of it. It's all to create family, community, connection, you know, so you don't have to feel disconnected. And, um, you know, we could, I could go on and on and on. I'm just trying to <laughs> put it out there the best I can, as quick as I can. But, yeah, I guess that's my answer for the minute. <laughs> yeah, Mitch, that reminds me of uh, a Bunwurrung elder once told me when I was living down in Melbourne, where I studied, that once you are welcomed onto country, you are now part guardianship of 
the country you are on and there's a responsibility mm -hmm. about that and just that question of bringing these traditional healing practices to a forefront I feel like you know people in cities need to start taking ownership for like where are they living what yeah. whose land are they living on and how are they actively contributing to the well-being of that country and that yeah. land and those waterways and I feel like once you start that relationship with whose mob you're living with or living on and then the land then you can start that process of understanding these beautiful ways of healing yeah for sure i think that's beautiful i mean imagine if everyone did that and took responsibility for just one part of the country they were on and been you know we'd be miles ahead um because you're right because we 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 need to be able to go home on country and not have to worry about all the chemicals from the farms in the river that we're meant to heal in you know we need to be able to go and just lay in that river and and know that we're not going to get out with some infection you know um and that you're so right brother because that is and has to be um a holistic you know community coming together unifying making it a priority and and that's the thing you know it's not i don't believe and i haven't been taught that country is just for us it's for everyone but you've just got to come in and and first and foremost, you know, you wouldn't go and just rip open someone's door and then go to their fridge. You knock, you get welcomed, you go through that process and then, you know, so on and so forth. So yeah, brother, I totally agree. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like when you, when you guys were talking about diets um, and going back to the traditional diets in my head, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, so my Nana, she's uh, Yundamu. She comes from uh, Walbury country. And up there in um, uh, near Alice Springs, there's there's um, bush orange, there's bush banana, there's bush coconut, there's bush potato. We have so much variety of food. It's there, um, available um, for the mob, and we're just we're just so used to going to what's easy for us. Mm -hmm. um, and and so it's 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 getting back to that natural diet. It's connecting with land. It's slowing down. It's slowing down your um, mind and and not living that fast pace. It's in in particular, when it comes to mental health, these are all aspects that we need to include in our everyday life. Yeah. Um, and bring and that that was our culture from the get go. Like that was us. 100%. And like, and also like, you know, it's making, you know, it's, it's valuing what our old people have to say and not diminishing it for, you know, some Ted talk. Um, and it's coming back to, to valuing that and understanding, understanding the, the truth in it and also being patient because our, our old people have been through a lot. And they're not going to just disclose everything in five seconds. And you have to be patient with that and understanding and go through it and go through it proper. And, and if you're someone that's accessing community for the first time or linking up for the first time, understand that it's just one of those things, you, you know, you need to be, you're going to have to be trusted with that knowledge and it's going to be a process. And, you know, and it's also utilizing technology too, because there's been times where mob have looked at me, I've gone to a gig and an aunt's come up and gone, Oh, you're, you're no good boy. You need to come home on country. And next minute they're mailing me bush medicine, you know, <laughs> to Melbourne so you can come back <laughs> taking these little capsules, you know, but it, and it's, and it's been able to reach out. Like even now, like once I, I learned some of our proper stuff um, many years ago, rather than go the gum leaf, I'll reach out and go, Oh, hey, brother, can you mail me some sandalwood? And we just hope, you know, they don't pick it up and think it's something a bit funky, you know? <laughs> And I'll get packages of sandalwood coming through to, to smoke myself at home and things. So yeah. we, we can, I think all of us um, connected or disconnected can be connected in some way or not, because, um, you know, our communities across this nation are, are nothing but beautiful and accepting if you, if you just go and knock on that door and respectfully, you know, follow those protocols. So. Yeah. Definitely. All right. I'm, I'm going to start wrapping things up guys and Jettison, I wanted to 
head over to you for our last question. Um, and that question is um, in, in particular our, our helpline. So Support Act have a First Nations helpline um, and uh, that's available to anyone who needs to speak to a counsellor. Counselor. Um, and now we don't want to diminish counsellors um, within this because talking to someone when you can't talk to anyone else um, is very important uh, for people to um, do and for people to be able to heal. So I just wanted to um, ask you, how can people access our helpline? You know what, it's, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Like it's just, you know, some people think that it's talking to a stranger, but it's not. It's, um, it's yarning with someone who's connected to your history. You know what I mean? I'm connected to everyone that's on the screen, you know, at the moment, even though I haven't met you in person. Um, I may not come from, you know, the same um, language area that you come from, but, you know, like we're connected. And you know what? If the government's going to put the money in for Aboriginal counsellors, come on, let's use the service. That's the way that I look at it, you know, as well. Like finally, finally they're putting the money behind it. Indeed, and um, they're, you know, recognising that uh, we need something different. Mm. We need to have a different conversation um, with people. And it's okay. That's, that's the most important part of it, in that it's okay. You just, you just make a phone call, you talk to someone, you tell them, you know, what sort of person you want to talk to, whether it's a, the same gender, um, the same sexuality, the same age, you know, that type of thing. And then, you know, we find something for you. Um, you might not always end up as someone with someone as crazy as me, but you might be lucky enough to get me too. You know what I mean? It's, it's a two-way street. But um, the most important part about being an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person in Australia is that you are never ever alone no matter how much you feel like that you're never ever alone so you can always pick up that phone yeah that's um definitely beautiful and and you're right that that helpline is always there available um for anyone who needs to access it yeah. um I just wanted to say a very big thank you for uh, Mal Baden and Jettison for coming on and talking about healing and healing from your perspective um, as, you know, uh, going back to our traditional healing um, and getting those cultural practices. So thank you again. Um, me and Mitch will close off. Um, so I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for joining. Um, please, please um, stick, uh, keep an eye out for the next Yarning Strong, which is in next year. Um, and I don't know if you guys heard the news, but we officially have Mitch on board as our um, permanent host. So you will see him there. <laughs> Um, for our next Yarning Strongs and we're doing uh, five next year um, and we're looking at a January kickoff. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone um, that that helpline there is available for you as well. Mitch, any departing words? Just want to say thanks heaps, Carissa, for, you know, making this happen. Um, the last few that I've done have been crazy and awesome and amazing and I realise how much hard work you put into it. Shout out to T-Roy uh, doing all the tech stuff. Really appreciate it. And uh, I know he needs a shout out. Come on. And I just want to say to everyone out there tuning in, you know what, next year, I'm just going to calm down. I'm going to stick more to just the questions I should ask. I'm not going to get all personal and ask more questions and put an hour onto the show, all right? But I can't help it. I'm a passionate follower, all right? So thanks heaps, everyone. Have a great Christmas. Take care. Look after yourselves. Remember, you're never alone. Um, there's always someone there. And you know what? All you have to do is go outside, look up into the stars, and remember all your ancestors are with you. A eh? big love, love or you mob. Yeni and Gully.
Womanindi, Nino Malu, Maragani, Malu, Judah, Bipalong, Kratangalang, Hornay. Hey everybody, my name is Jamie Thomas. I'm the co creator of Wayapa Work, a uh, wellness practice based on Indigenous ways and philosophies of uh, mindfulness, uh, connection, and action about taking care of the mother. Our practice, Wayapa, is a language word from my grandmother's country in the western part of Victoria, the Pikwurong people. Uh, of the Mara Nation and Wapa means to join. Wuruk is from where I am here, Gurnai country. That means earth, connect to earth for well being. When we talk about well being, we always talk about mind, body, and spirit. But I think what's been missing in that conversation for a very, very long time is the ancient ways of wellness and putting earth first, looking care, look, taking care of the earth. And um, if we do that, our mind, body, and our spirit will be better. So, for example, you know, sitting out on country is an amazing thing, but looking after country is even more amazing because we're actually looking after it for generations to come, just like our ancestors did for thousands of years. Before I start this little yarn and visualization, I just want to connect you back to ancient concepts. I'm just going to light a little fire here. Something I do every day to help me connect in. Um, it's a little smoking autumn bowl here, help me connect in and respect the mother for all the resources that we have and uh, our connections to fire. For thousands of years, our ancestors sat around fire, shared stories and knowledge and yarns. So I just want to light that fire in respect of our mother. I also would like to say thanks so much for attending the Support Act Mental Health and Traditional Cultural Healing uh, process. You know, it is an important part of looking after our mental health. And what we're gonna do today is give you a tool of earth connection for your own well-being and then hope that you take that concept and go off and look after country uh, as we all do. So I'd like to just start by asking you to um, close your eyes. Um, close your eyes and I want you to focus on a special place that you love to visit. A special place on country or a special place you've visited or been introduced to. A place where you feel totally connected and embodied in. So close your eyes and visualize that special place. If you feel safe enough, close your eyes. Would you take a nice big deep breath in and out. In and out. Feeling that breath, the very essence of life. I just want you to connect you to the ancient songs and sounds. Arr So as you cut your eyes closed, visualizing that special place, I want you to think about the creator. What does the creator mean to you? What is that thought process, concept? Having love and gratitude from the creator in the Southwest from Melbourne through to the South Australian border, the creator was Bunjil. There is the rainbow spirit creator, there is by Amy. There is Borden and Tuck the Mustak from this country, the creators of the people. So what do you think about when you think about the creator? In Moyapa, we talk about love and gratitude from everything from the stars to the water, to the earth, everything around us that gives us life, connecting into the creator. As you sit on that country, I want you to think about the sun. Do you love to go there and watch a sunrise? Watch that sun rise in the east and move across the sky. We're coming up to the time of the summer solstice, the longest day of the shortest night, connecting into that sunset. On your special place, is it rising over the desert? over the ocean, over a forest, a rainforest. To so connect into the energy, the healing energy, that vitamin D of the sun. Does your mob have a story for that? Connecting into the third element, the moon. The power and the energy of the moon cycle. The 27, 28 day cycle of that new moon. 
we've got a new moon coming up this Saturday. It is an eclipse, very powerful opening of a portal. Then that moon will wax on the left hand side here in the southern hemisphere and build up to a beautiful, big, powerful full moon. Again, your special place. Have you observed a moon cycle as that moon traces across the sky? Not just during the night, but during the day. You can see the moon as much during the day as you can the night. Connecting into that energy, how it's pulling all the water around the planet, those tides, how it's pulling all the water in our bodies, affecting us physiologically, psychologically. The more we're in tune with that, and mental health can be aligned with that practice of moon connection. That special place you are now, element four, is the mother, is Mother Earth. This is where we get our wellness from. Nature, the environment, the land, the sea. What does your special place look like? As I said before, is it a mountain? Is it a beach? I want you to stop and take a nice big deep breath. Visualize what you can see, visualize what you can smell, visualize what you can hear, visualize what you can feel. Feel that energy and essence of the mother holding you as you sit or stand on country. I want you to look into the sky. I want you to watch a storm rolling in from a clear day or a starry night. All of a sudden, them clouds roll in, connecting into the fifth element of Wayapa, which is the lightning. There is energy and power in lightning. It is beneficial for our mother, Mother Earth. The three types of lightning, that inner cloud lightning that lights up the sky, the cloud to cloud lightning, that actually creates nitrate from the splitting of nitrogen. That sound you hear, what we call thunder, it is the sound of nit lightning splitting that nitrogen. It fertilizes the land, all the plants, the animals. We benefit from that. We connect into the cloud to ground lightning, the power and the energy of that lightning. It charges up the landscape. When you're out there, you feel alive in that lightning storm. Be respectful of that lightning because it can create fire. For billions of years, Mother Earth used that lightning to create fire for the evolution of all the plants and the animals. Our ancestors knew this. Ancient cultures knew this. They lit fires for cooking, for warmth, for ceremony, but also for country. Connecting back and honoring and having respect for lightning and the fire and our ancestors that made that lightning. Did it connect into the sixth element of Wapa? It is the rain. It is honoring the process of water evaporating on the earth's surface, forming them clouds and then raining. The water that we have that evaporates off the land is ancient water. It is three and a half billion years old. Our ancestors drank the water we are drinking. So that rain is literally a process of cycles. Thinking about that one water source that we have for humanity is in that rain. I want you to feel the rain falling on you. Is it a cold rain? Is it a warm rain? Is it falling from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south? connect into that falling rain. I want you to think about the wind blowing those rain clouds away. This is the seventh element of Waihapa. Connect into the wind, the moving of oxygen, the necessity again. Mother Earth's tool moves oxygen around the planet. That oxygen that is created. That wind picks up the pollens and the seeds from the plants and flowers and trees and blows them across the landscape. It moves nutrients from, from one place to the other, sometimes over thousands of kilometers of seas to deposit in other areas, fertilizing, but moving life around. Think about the eighth element of Waiapa. 
which will become a seed in your visualization. As you blow from a tree, fall to the ground and carried by that wind, I want you to think about being embedded in that mother, in that soil, in that womb. And as you grow, all the elements that we just spoke about, our mother, the wind that got us here, the rain that fell, the lightning that creates the nitrate, the moon, which helps us grow down through our root system on that waning moon and up on that waxing moon. We're being pulled as a tree. Think about the sun, the photosynthesis from that sun. All these seven elements help create life. The life of trees and plants, the ancients, the elders. I want you to think about the ninth element, which is the air element. Think about an air animal that you connect to in a country. You could be that big mighty eagle flying right down to this busy little mosquito flying around me right now. You could be a bat, you could be a bee. What's your special air element that you connect to on country? Look at yourself and life from the perspective of that bird's eye view, take that bigger picture. As we come down from the air, we're gonna come down to the ground and be grounded on mother. Do you think about a land animal that you connect to? These animals are more ancient than we are. They were here first. Some of our stories say we descend from these animals. Think about how uh, the well-being of an animal is perfect. They live in harmony with their environment. They know when to rest. They know when to hunt, to find food, to, to reproduce. The kangaroo, for example, she can close down her reproductive organs if there is a drought, living in perfect harmony. How can we learn these lessons? As we go from the land, of course, we go into the water. Mother Earth, its embodiment, more water than Earth. 65 to 70% of our mother is water. 65%, 70% of our body is water. Think about a water element that lives in that water. From the mightiest of blue whales in the ocean to the smallest of plankton. The small little microorganisms that live in a drop of water in the driest of desert. Those fish eggs that lay dormant in those desert streams for years. And that rain comes down from the sky. All those cycles happen again, bringing life to all living things in water. Rain and water connected our responsibility to look after the waterways so important for our well-being and the well-being of others i want you to think about now our ancient ancestors the hunters on your country your special place what did they hunt what was the knowledge systems needed hunting in the water hunting on the land hunting in the air creating technology the spears, the boomerangs, the nets, the knowledge of the seasons and cycles of these animals as they moved around country and the knowledge to only take what they needed for tomorrow, for next week, for next month, for next generation. The gatherers balancing out the feminine and masculine, how they went out and gathered the food source from the mother, the knowledge they had, the knowledge systems and structures, plants, medicines, the tools, digging sticks, the weaving of the baskets. Again, the passing on of knowledge. Some say our people have been here for 100,000 plus years. I, be I believe we've been here since the beginning. So if we've been here for that time, we had to have that knowledge of well-being, of connectivity, of responsibility, of reciprocity. And we give that all to the last element of Wayapa, which is the 14th element, who is the child. 
child becomes the creator. We have become full circle. They are the conduit of thousands of generations of knowledge, of earth connection. They are the conduits of a process of purpose, responsibility, and reciprocity. We nurture that child, we praise and love that child, we teach that child the stories, the ancient stories of the landscape, the ancient stories of the seasons and cycles of respect, responsibility, and again, reciprocity. So for your well-being, you know, and this is an amazing opportunity, you know, through the Support Act's On Mind First Nation series, you know, yarning strong for our mental health, for our our mental, emotional, physical, spiritual health all comes from the mother. So when you're ready, I just want you to think about that special place. Take a nice big deep breath. About your ancestors. Individually look over your shoulder where you walk in the footsteps of a thousand generations. You walk in the footsteps of people who are healthy and well. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years of years since the beginning of time. When you're ready, open your eyes. So when we talk about Wayapa, it was a conversation that came out of an experience that I had. I walked into a mind-body-spirit festival in the middle of the city. And I said to my co-creator of the practice, Sarah, there's an important word missing here. And she said, what's that, Jamie? And I said, it's the mother, Mother Earth, because you cannot have a healthy mind, body, and spirit without the mother. So we put our connection back into place. We put in our responsibility and reciprocity back to the mother. We start to feel good. Feel good for ourselves, eating healthy food. We're out there moving like our ancestors exercising. Have a healthy mind because we are connected. Our spirit. I walked up and down those stall holders, 500 stall holders represented from cultures all over the world. Not one Aboriginal stall in there. Not one stall was talking about looking after the mother and sustainability. The very thing that our health and well-being is reliant on. So please go out, connect to the mother. She will hold you in times of fear, anxiety, depression. She will take that away. That's what she does. Science is only just catching up to our ancient knowledge that they know that hugging a tree, touching a tree, being under a tree automatically sets off a chemical well-being within our bodies, physically, emotionally, spiritually. We are better when we are connected. When you can't connect to the mother physically, sit down, close your eyes as we just did then. Visualize your special place. The sounds that you can hear in your special place. What can you smell? What can you feel? That will keep you and hold you until you can get back in touch with the mother. So please, before we finish, I just want to remind everyone about Support Acts First Nations dedicated support line, which you can call on 1-800-595-500. Press option C. And if you, that's if you want to reach out and speak to someone. So if you're an artist or an artist manager, crew or music worker, and you're struggling financially, these might be here to help. COVID has created massive impacts on, on the industries, the industries that you're involved in. And guess what? They've got support there. They've got financial support available and can be accessed via their, their um, website. So go to the Support Acts website, www supportact.org.au and the financial support will close on the 31st of December. Okay, so apply by the 3rd, applications open on the 3rd. So I want you more to stay safe, keep your mind, your body and your spirit strong through Earth Connection. I say Yadabi from my mob here, Bubaduk from my grandmother's and my children's mob and stay deadly. All the peace, all the presence for a good life. Catch your mob around.